Hello and welcome to North Shore Fellowship's online service. We are glad that you have tuned in. If you're watching on Facebook, would you click the like and the share button? And if you are watching on YouTube, would you share the link with a friend? That way, other people can find out about this ministry of North Shore Fellowship and get the blessings that are here. Now let's lean in to today's service and ask a blessing over us. Father, we ask that you lead us in this time. We ask that you give us open hearts and open minds to receive what you have. Father, build us up to be strong in you and help us to be a blessing to this lost and hurting world. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship. Welcome back to our series, Without Excuse, and it's a study of the book of Romans, the book that Paul wrote to the Roman church, a church he had never been to before. 
eager to go, but has never been to. And he gives such foundational pieces of doctrine and understanding the faith and understanding how we can be justified, how we can be made right with God through the Hebrew scriptures, which is all he had to work with at the time. So last week we started the beginning of Romans 5, and this week we're going to do the second half of Romans 5. But I just want to remind you of what we did last week a little bit. We hit Romans 5, 3 and 4, which says, We also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. You see that chain of events, tribulations, perseverance, character, and then hope. And it's this process where tribulations, the trials and struggles that we are dealing with, that brings about something in us. It brings about the next word, perseverance, which is really patient endurance. And as we patiently endure those struggles and those trials, what produces in us is character. Character, the ability to stand firm and steadfast in the face of adversity. And when you have that, you get the last result, and that's the word hope, hope which is confident expectation for the future. Who doesn't want that? And so it's a great reminder that the things you're experiencing, what Paul calls these momentary light afflictions, they're producing perseverance and character and ultimately hope in you. And that hope will never disappoint. All right, and then let's jump to verse 12, which is this, you know, the second half of Romans in our, in our eyes is where we divided it. And we're going to go 12 to 21. So those nine verses are going to say a lot and just buckle your seatbelts because Paul lays a lot out in this short piece of scripture, starting with verse 12 in Romans 5. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. That's verse 12. Now verse 13 starts in some versions, New King James, King, King James, a parenthetical statement that starts with verse 13 and ends in verse 17. It's like these parentheses to explain what he means by those last three words, because all sinned. So he explains. Verse 13, to be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. But, verse 15, but the gift is not like the trespass. For if many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if, by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in the life of the one man, Jesus Christ? Verse 18, Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and the life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. The law was brought so the trespass, so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay, didn't I tell you? There's a lot in those nine verses. There's a lot there. And so Paul points out there's these dispensations, if you will, this, these, these um, lengths of time where different uh, ca categories or different consequences of the law exist. Let me explain what I mean. He says from Adam to Moses, there was no law. Now that's the really the period of time from the beginning of man, Adam, to Moses, which is around 2,600 years. And during that time, there was not yet a law. Now, it was, there were some commands, as we see, but there was not yet the law that we needed to abide by. Uh, Romans 5, 14, we just read it. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even, though, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam. All right, I'll talk about that in a second. So that's Adam to Moses. And then you have the period of Moses to Jesus, 
where we were under the law. Right? So Deuteronomy 6.25, and if we are careful to obey this law before the Lord God, as he commanded, that will be our righteousness. So that was the deal. During the time from Moses until Jesus, our righteousness was found how? By keeping the law, as we just read in Deuteronomy 6. And then you have this period of from Jesus to us, to modern day, that's from the time Jesus freed us from the law, fulfilled the law, till today. And we live in a time where we're not bound by the law, we're not under the law, we live by grace through faith. And so Romans 8, 2 says, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin and death. And then we'll talk about that as well. So just think about those three segments, Adam to Moses, Moses to Jesus, Jesus to us. Now, Paul talks repeatedly about, in, in, in this book of Romans, about the time before the law. In the previous chapters, he mentions this quite a bit. You keep hearing that phrase over and over, that Abraham believed the Lord and it was reckoned unto him or counted to him or credited to him as righteousness. So Abraham, he lived in that 2600 year period between Adam and Moses. So there was no law for him to abide by, but his righteousness or his justification came by faith. That's how we live as well. All right, so Romans 2.15 says, um, they show that the requirements of the law are written in their hearts. This is how Abraham lived. This is how people lived that did not have the law. And Paul even says in that verse, which was Romans 2, 15, the Gentiles who don't have the law. How do they live? How can they know what to do? How can you know what, what's right and wrong? We just said that, that they have the law, at least a portion of God's uh, expectations, written on their hearts. And these are those of whom he spoke about, where we got our, chapter, our series title, Without Excuse. What if you don't have the law? What if you don't have the scrolls of Moses and you live during that time, or even today? What if you've never been exposed to the Bible? Well, God made provision for that in Romans 1.20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. There's no excuse for anyone to say, I don't believe in God. I don't think there's a God. God has constantly, through the, from the beginning of time, been making known his eternal uh, attributes, his power, his divine nature. And so we are without excuse. But unlike us, we live in this day, as Christians living in this day, who have been given salvation in Jesus, resulting in spiritual life, they only had spiritual death because of sin. And this is why Paul said in verse 14, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses. Death reigned. What does that mean? That, that death was a result of the sin of Adam. See, once sin came into the world, death came with it. That was really the consequence of the first sin. I'll show you that in just a second. And that death was not just to Adam, but it was passed on to all his descendants, including all of us, all the people. Everyone experienced that death that was passed on to mankind through perpetuity. That's why it said in verse 12 of this, of this chapter, therefore just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people. See, people are born now spiritually dead, spiritually dead. Adam's sin resulted in the curse that was placed on Adam and his, the entire human race and all of creation. And it, the curse was spiritual death. Death. That's why in my book, Soul of the Spirit, you know, we look at carefully at that, that. That Adam and Eve, they were told by God, if you sin, you're going to die. The serpent said, no, you're not going to die. They ate of the forbidden fruit and they didn't die. Body, soul, and spirit. Well, wait a minute. Spiritually, they did die. They still had their body. They still had their soul. But their spiritual death, and this is what occurred during that fall of man, spiritual death. And that's been passed on to generation after generation. Because the Lord gave Adam one command in this portion of Scripture. One command. Not the whole law that he gave Moses. One command. And that was this. Do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the consequence of eating of that tree is death. 
We see this in Genesis 2, 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you will surely die. Well, they ate of it. And did they die? The death they experienced was the death of their spirit. Now they were bound to living only in the body, which was still alive, and the soul, mind and emotions, still functional. But both of those were subject to death. So when they die, their body dies, and guess what? Their soul goes with it. And unless their spirit was regenerated or made alive, they are going to experience eternal death. That was the curse of spiritual death passed down to their descendants. In fact, every person that was ever born bore the curse of spiritual death. They're born spiritually dead, except one person. One person whose father was not human. In fact, his father was the Holy Spirit. And so he was born spiritually alive. And that's the reason that Jesus is the only one who can make those who are dead in spirit alive in spirit through his Holy Spirit. And he's the way, the truth, and the what? The life. Life. So what does it look like when someone's spiritually dead? All the people that, that do not have the Holy Spirit, that have not been made alive, sad to say, it may be news to you, they're spiritually dead. It means that their spirits have not yet been made alive through Jesus. Well, they may be physically alive. Of course, some of them are more healthy than I am. And they may obviously be adequately stable mentally and emotionally, meaning their soul, their mind, and their emotions are alive. Maybe they're smarter than me and maybe more emotionally uh, sound than I am. But their spirits are dead if they have not been made alive through God's Holy Spirit within them. That's why many of our family and friends and loved ones have no affinity or even perception of the things of the Spirit. They don't, may not even believe in God, and therefore they're unaware and unattracted to the things of the Lord. That's why 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, the natural man, that's someone who's not been made alive in the Spirit, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, they are foolishness to him, and nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. And that's why being made alive in the Spirit is so important, because of the curse of Adam that we're talking about. We're born with, we are born with death in the flesh, but we can be born again with life in the Spirit. All right, let's continue. Paul says in verse 17 and 18, he says, For if by the trespass of one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life, and life for all people. Just as through the disobedience of one man, the many were made sinners, also through the obedience of one man, the many will be made righteous. You see, he keeps talking about one man and one man. Obviously, the first man that released this pandemic of spiritual death was Adam, and that permeated the earth and has for 6,000 years. But one man, 2,000 years ago, Jesus rectified all that through his death on the cross and his resurrection, so that we can be free from that curse of sin and are given life in the Spirit and are reconciled to God. And Paul talks about that in the beginning of the chapter. You see, Adam messed things up. Jesus made things right. It's that simple. And verse 20 says this, something sort of peculiar. It said, The law was brought in so that, the tres so that trespass might increase. Or in this version, it said, The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. That does not sound like a good idea. What is that? So, so the law was given so that the trespass might increase. What does that mean? It's an interesting verse. It seems to be saying that the law was given so that people would sin more. But that's not what this means. It's simply saying that the law was brought in so that we can recognize our sins. Recognize what is sin and what is not sin. And once we do recognize those sins, we can repent of them and receive grace and be forgiven for them or of them. The law shows the trespasses. Let me give you an example. Think about like a football game or an amateur neighborhood football game, maybe a Thanksgiving family football game. 
I know when I was growing up, we would play football in the park and we didn't have a football field that was lined and gridded. So we would just make up boundaries like, you know, that tree is out of bounds. This tree over there is end zone. That bush is the left sideline and the corner of that house straight is the other sideline. Let's play. And, you know, inevitably somebody would be running close to what was one of these predetermined borders, invisible borders. And someone would say, hey, you went out of bounds. And they would say, no, I didn't. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. Look, the tree's there. The bush is there. The corner of the house is there. And it gets really confusing because we really don't know what is right and what is wrong. <laughs> when you play on a real football t f field, the lines are clear. And so when you step out of bounds, you can receive an actual penalty. But you can be penalized. And then in God's eyes, you can also be forgiven. And that's what the law does. It says, here's what's right. Here's what's wrong. When you sin, you could be forgiven of your sin because you know that it's sin. That's what it says. The law was brought in so that trespass might increase. But it says this, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Oh, and that's the really good news. This is a really sweet verse because Jesus knows our sin. So he knows how much grace is needed to cover our sin. And the more sin we do, the more grace is needed. His appeal to us is to come as we are, however sinful, however much in need of forgiveness. Come and receive mercy and grace. And once we come humbly yet boldly, we receive that mercy and he washes us and cleanses us and restores us and forgives us. Hebrews 4, 16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in time of need. What an invitation. He doesn't say, cleanse yourself of sin by living a flawless life. And when you are spotlessly ready, then you could think about coming into the throne room and receiving grace. No, in his mercy and his grace, he does the forgiving. He does, he's the one that makes us worthy. He is the one that cleanses us of all unrighteousness. First John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us and purify us of all unrighteousness. That is such good news. So you see, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound, even if it doesn't seem fair. Even if it doesn't seem fair to somebody stepped out of the sideline and said, yeah, you definitely were or in the penalty zone, or you stepped out of bounds, but you know what? You're forgiven. God can do that. God can do that. Jesus pointed this out to the Pharisees. He ran into this issue with the Pharisees. And let me just read this section of scripture. You may remember this, but it's a very interesting thing in this story. He tells a story within this story. And Luke says this in verse, I'm sorry, chapter seven of Luke, verse 36. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman, it's possible it's Mary Magdalene, from the city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet and she wiped them off with her hair. And she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. And then Jesus answered his thoughts. Think about that. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other but neither of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, I suppose the one whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash my, the dust off my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only a little love. 
And then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. Wow. Where sin abounds, grace that much more abounds. Do we ever act like this Pharisee? Do we ever respond in pride and arrogance when we see someone who's clearly operating in, you know, in sin, but also coming to Jesus in humility and repentance, and they receive mercy that they don't really deserve? <laughs> we can't allow that. We didn't, we didn't deserve it. Jesus gave it to us. And when that start, that kind of pharisaical attitude starts building up, we've really got to repent of that because we'll, we'll keep people away. We have to ask the Lord for a pharisectomy. We pulls it all out of us and makes it right. I remember a man I encountered at church. His, um, he, was, he would come to church. I had never seen him before. A very unique person. And uh, I would speak or sometimes be singing and he'd be in the congregation and he would come in a little bit late stranger and just be leering at me or whoever was speaking kind of just leering this very stern countenance but what was unusual about the man was he was huge i mean he was like a bull he was you know six foot five and just all solid muscle broad shoulders huge man he looked like a biker or or a WWF wrestler type, and just leering. It looked really intimidating. And so after a couple weeks, maybe a few weeks, I decided I'm just going to go talk to the guy. <laughs> I mean, no one knows who he is. So he was leaving because he tried to leave early before he had to talk to his people. And I kind of chased him out the door. I said, hey, hey, friend, just wanted to say hello. And he looked at me and said, oh, no, I'm sorry. I don't belong here. I'm a very wicked person. I, I'm, I don't want to mess things up. I'm sorry. I've got to go. I, gotta go. I said, no, no, no. The fact that you're here means that you belong here. You belong here. And I tried to make him feel as welcome as I could. And he came back. He continued to come back. Got a chance to know him a little bit, know his story. He had a motorcycle accident. Got a chance to pray for him in the, uh, in the hospital. And for years, he'd come. And the Lord slowly, not right away, slowly started to transform his life into becoming a brand new person. In fact, he gave testimony of his life on Easter Sunday one time. He is a person who came, who did not feel worthy to come. He definitely felt like an outsider. He definitely felt like his sins were many. But we, as much as we could, we tried to say, hey, though your sins are many, where sin abounds, grace even more so abounds. Come freely. Come, to the, come boldly to the throne of grace and receive mercy. Well, I believe our church is coming to a season where we are going to be welcoming people like that regularly. So how will we respond when people come to us like that? They come, you know, feeling awkward. They somehow make their way to one of our services. And as comfortable as they can be, they walk in and they sit and they listen and they experience the worship and they listen to the message. How will we respond? Well, my hope is that when they meet you and when they meet me, that they're received with love and kindness, uh, that they're welcomed into this environment of joy that they've never experienced before. And regardless of who they are or how they are or where they came from, they can be encouraged to come boldly to the throne of grace and receive mercy, just like you did, just like I did, just like any of us did when we first came. Come. Billy Graham used one certain song for years, for decades, one specific song in all of his evangelistic crusades. It was the altar call or the invitational to come. And the song had a very simple message. Just come, come just as you are, come. It was a, a song for a sinner coming to Jesus to receive mercy, to receive grace and forgiveness. And very likely more people came to salvation during the singing of this song than any other song in recorded history. And here's what it said. It said, just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. And one of the next verses, just as I am, thou wilt receive, will welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve. Because thy promise, I believe, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. When we come to Jesus, whether it's for 
initial salvation, for forgiveness of our sins, or just to feel close to him again, he will always welcome us. A contrite heart, he will never, never turn away. He welcomes us to come boldly to the throne of grace and receive mercy. Even if we are abounding in sin because where sin abounds, grace even that much more abounds. Come to him. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor. Good morning to you all. Warmest welcome. Great to be with you again, as always. Well, Thanksgiving is right around the corner, but we still have a lot of things going on. Let's dig in and see what we have. Sunday, November the 19th, the Fellowship of Christian Athletes is having a 5K walk run. Now, this is a fundraiser for them, and they are a terrific ministry. So if you'd like to walk, if you'd like to run, if you'd like to just simply sponsor and donate, we have their URL. You get onto their website. You do everything through there. Again, this is a terrific ministry. They do wonderful work. If you can come alongside of them, it would really be wonderful to do. For the ladies, I want to remind you that on Monday, they have the Women's Online Bible Study Group. Now, they meet on Zoom. They're meeting from 7 to 8 p.m. And uh, weekly through November the 20th, it is led by Lisa Jeannie and Michelle Hackworth. And their current study is Seeing God as the Perfect Father. We have the link for you. All you have to do is dial in and join them. Sounds like a great study. I hope that you'll be able to participate with them. Also for the ladies, want to remind you, coming up is the Women's Monthly Breakfast. The next one is going to be Saturday, December the 2nd. They begin at 9 a.m. Now they meet at the Women's Club of Red Bank. Now they do have a URL and a QR code. Everything is free. There's no charge for anything, but they do ask for an RSVP. Want to make sure they have everything set up for the number of people that are coming. It is a terrific time. Great fellowship. Uh, great teaching goes on there. I hope that you'll be able to come out and join them, ladies. So again, and that's Saturday, December the 2nd at 9 a.m. at the Women's Club of Red Bank. Got just one more thing for you to get on your calendars, and that is the North Shore Fellowship Christmas Fellowship. Save the date. It's going to be Friday, December the 8th, 7 to 9 p.m. Now, we're also going to be at the Women's Club of Red Bank. We did it there last year. It's a terrific location. Um, so we have the address for you there. We're going to have fellowship. We're going to have music. And we're going to be having, like, finger foods and desserts. We will have sign-ups if you'd like to bring those along and share those with other people. There will be uh, a love gift exchange. So bring a wrapped gift under $10. Put one in. Take one out. It really is just a terrific time to get together and a way to kick off the Christmas season. So get it on your calendars Friday, December the 8th, 7 to 9 p.m. at the Women's Club of Red Bank. Well, this is not everything that's going on, and we're getting ready to head over to our new space very, very soon. You really want to be on our email list. Do that by sending your contact information to us at info at northshorenj.org. Everything comes to your inbox. Easiest way to keep up with everything that's going on. Regular events during the week, uh, Sunday online services, 9 and 10.30 a.m. on Facebook and YouTube premiere. And our Sunday in-person service continues at 10 a.m. We're still at the Middletown South High School in the Southside Theater. You come in on the side by the football stadium. Just look for the sign. We're right there. The theater's right there. It's very easy to find us. We would love to have you come out and join us. Well, allow me to take this opportunity just to say thank you. Thank you to all of you who've just been so steadfast in your financial support of everything that goes on here at North Shore Fellowship. We invite all of you to come and participate with us financially, to take just a portion of what God has provided and put it back to getting his word and his love out in this area. If you go to our website and pull down on the menu, there's a giving page there. We even have a QR code. Point your phone or your tablet at it. It'll take you right there. We even have donate by text. Just make sure that you have the right number. So it's very easy to have your financial gift come in. Would you join me as we pray over the offering that we'll receive this morning? Lord, we thank you. We thank you for all the gifts that you provide. We thank you for the hope and salvation that can only come from you. We ask now, Father, that you would take this gift, that you would take it and purpose it, that you would multiply it, direct it, and use it exactly as you see fit. Father, make us wise for the work that you have for us. Be pleased with everything that we do with it. Bless us in all the work that we have. Direct our ministry now, Father. All these things we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
So, hey, busy season going on and the holidays are coming in, but there's still a lot of activities. We would love to have you come out. We would love to see you in person. And remember, you are always welcome and it absolutely won't be the same without you. So come on out and join us. We'd love to have you. Have a terrific week and may God bless you all. Thanks for joining us at North Shore Fellowship Online. I hope that you receive something from the Word of God or the worship or the announcements. And those are important too because those are invitations for you to come and join us at some of the many events that are going on and also on Sunday morning. But most importantly, Jesus is inviting you to come to give your life to him so he could come into your life, give you salvation, 
an eternal life, if you've never done that, well then come, reach out to me or one of the staff. We'd be glad to lead you in a prayer of salvation. Don't put it off. Come to Jesus. God bless you.